Welcome, everyone. We are so happy to see such a wonderful turnout for the first of our Shulman lectures uh, for this semester. I'm just going to say a few words about the series and about the course that Lori Santos, my name is Henry Coles, I should say, that Lori Santos and I are, are running, of which this series is a part, and then I'll turn things over to Lori to introduce our speaker. So the Shulman Lectures are presented under the auspices of the Frankie Program in Science and the Humanities, which is made possible, as many of you will know, by the generosity of Richard and Barbara Frankie. The series is named after Robert Shulman, Sterling Professor Emeritus of Chemistry, Molecular Biophysics and Biochemistry, and Senior Research Scientist in Diagnostic Radiology, in recognition of his roles as a founding fellow of the Whitney and as an unwavering supporter of the integration of the sciences and the humanities. And we couldn't be more grateful for that. This is the, the brief of the Shulman Seminar, which is the course that Lori and I are teaching, of which this lecture is a part. And our topic that we've chosen this year, and the topics vary every year, is other minds, as you all know. Uh, the, the, sort of, um, the motivation behind that is that I'm a historian of psychology and the human sciences, and I study the history of how psychologists and others tried to find out what was in the minds of animals, children, and other humans in the late 19th century. So the emergence of experimental psychology and comparative psychology. Lori, as it turns out, is a psychologist, and she studies the contents of other minds, including those of dogs and non-human primates. So uh, we've been coming together for a few weeks with uh, 20 students scattered in the audience to, uh, I was going to say to uh, debate history versus science, but that is precisely not what we have done. We have synthesized everything from Darwin to the present week after week on topics like language, morality, and science and religion. And we are now moving into a series of weeks on specific animals starting this week with the topic of dogs. So I'll turn it over to Lori to introduce our speaker. Thanks so much. It gives me huge, huge pleasure to be able to introduce Alexandra Horowitz. Dr. Horowitz got her BA degree in philosophy at the University of Pennsylvania, and then later her MS and PhD in cognitive science at the University of California at San Diego. She's currently an associate professor at Barnard College at Columbia, where she teaches both canine cognition and creative nonfiction. So she's the perfect pick for the Shulman lecture series. Um, at Barnard, Dr. Horowitz one, runs the Barnard Dog Cognition Lab, where she studies how dogs make sense of the world. In addition to co-authoring like so many influential academic papers, I couldn't keep track. She's also the author of a number of popular books, um, several of which have made number one on the New York Times bestselling list, including Inside the Mind of a Dog, What Dogs See, Smell, and Know, On Looking, A Walker's Guide to Art of the Art of Observation, and most recently, Being a Dog, following the dog into a world of smell. Now, when I was challenged with putting together this Shulman lecture series with Henry, the first person I wanted to bring out was Dr. Horowitz. And it's in part because she's someone that I've admired for a very, very long time, but have not had a chance to meet. Um, and it was also because both her scientific scholarship and the awesome things that she's done to communicate science to the public seems like a really perfect fit with this lecture series. Um, she's this incredibly rare combination of an, a super, super successful scholar. Some of her papers are the most influential papers in the field of canine cognition and a true communicator of science, somebody that can bring these esoteric topics like thinking in a dog's mind and how walking affects your senses of the world and your sense of exploration to a general lay audience, so much so that she's been able, through her books, to bring new students to the science of canine cognition. So when we, at our own lab here at Yale, we host a summer internship program for students interested in canine cognition. And so many of them who come to the field to be scholars themselves started in part because of one of Dr. Horowitz's books. And so I'm super excited to introduce her and to hear her talk about what is it like to be a dog. I think what you'll see is both this wonderful combination of science and communication in action. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Horowitz. Wow. Well, that was a very lovely, gracious introduction. Thank you, Lori, and thank you, Henry, and thank you to Yale. I'm delighted to be uh, the first, the lead off Other Minds speaker here. Um, it's perfect because I really got into science with an interest in Other Minds, so framed. Um, I didn't know I was going to be studying dogs at the time. I was just interested in nonverbal, non-human animals. And 
I wound my way around to finding out that dogs were the perfect subject, um, and then I just got interested in dogs. So it's where I began, and I have a great fondness for the topic. Um, and I'm still asking this question to myself all the time, what is it like to be a dog? In fact, I should warn you, I'm not going to answer the question today. I wish I could. Instead, I think I'm going to um, talk about approaches to the question, different ways to approach the question, and in particular ways that I have um, approached it. I, it's fascinating to study the domestic dog because in some ways the dog is very familiar. Probably there are dogs associated with many of you. And at the same time, the dog is kind of paradoxical in its um, life with humans. Uh, for instance, we breed dogs for their sameness to each other, but we really celebrate their difference from each other. Um, they're kept in our homes, um, and yet they're regularly abandoned. You know, we'll name one, and yet as a society, we anonymously euthanize millions every year. We celebrate in some way their animalism, um, we might feed them bones, for instance, but we also enforce a kind of ersatz humanness, um, dressing them in sweaters or raincoats, you know, holding birthday parties for them. Um, we cut their ears in some breeds to look more like wild canids, but we also, in breeding, have shortened their faces so that they look more like primates, more like us. I'm interested in one big paradox, which is that we have this full vocabulary to talk about the minds of dogs. Dog owners, as dog owners and people who live with dogs, we do. What they're feeling, what they know, what they understand, the grudges they might be holding, the pride they might be experiencing. And yet, on the other hand, very little of it is empirically grounded. The science of dog cognition, as Laura was saying, is, is extremely recent, very new. So these tensions come out in my research and the research in my lab, and I want to tell you about the research that plays into this latter contrast with the kind of attributions that we make of dogs on the one hand, and on the other, what it might actually be like to be a dog. If you're here, you probably know something about the history of domestication. Or, um, you've read a little bit about the research on that. We know that dogs are... Um, are um, come from a, pro a proto-wolf of some sort, descended from uh, a wolf-like animal, from which the common gray wolf and the domestic dog both descended independently. Most of the story of domestication is told through archaeology or genetics, but I thought we'd take a slightly different path to talking about the recent history of dogs and talk about um, the history of dogs' representation in art. Um, just briefly, to get you to think about how we've thought about dogs and how that's changed. So this is a little bit of like an ethologist at the museum kind of thing. We're just going to look at the depiction of art, of the dogs in the art here, not at the symbolism of the art. And please excuse me for running roughshod rough over uh, any um, art historical understanding. In the ver very earliest representations of dogs had them behaving. So in cave paintings, in this 11th century portrait, they were among humans, but acting in some way, acting potentially as um, hunters or guards um, or as retrievers for game. And then they began sneaking into domestic scenes. So you can barely see, but you know, at the bottom of this Van Eyck is um, a little dog between them underfoot, um, or in this Rembrandt, redone a few years later, in a street scene, performing a nice natural behavior, incidentally, um, in our places of worship, um, and in some cases, replacing humans. So here's this beautiful petition that shows Venus being attended to by Cupid and a lute player, and then three years later, the lute player has been replaced by a little dog. And not long after that, though, they trotted from the side of the shot, the side of the canvas, to be featured um, with us, centrally. Often mirroring us in some way, <laughs> reflecting on us. And then as show breeding began in the end of the 19th century, suddenly there's a change, you know, they're alone um, in the picture. 
there's still objects here, objects of fancy, the dog fancy, and in some ways these images are like still lifes that include the object that is the dog. But in the 20th century, and actually a little earlier, around the time of Darwin, this really changes. And then suddenly what you have is just portraits of the dog as subject. I love this one as it reflects the dog potentially reflecting itself to us and to itself. Um, and then this, I feel like this is when we maybe became in interested in them as individuals and started talking about their minds. Um, and then, then this kind of radical transformation happened. <laughs> it's rare that I get to use this in an academic talk. But in some ways, it's a perfect representation of a lot of the things that we think about dogs. This works insofar as it does work because we're willing to assume that dogs could be at some level poker players. And in fact, there's even deception happening. <laughs> Right? And so if there's anything that's about other minds, it's the ability to manipulate the knowledge states of others, and dogs are doing it to us. In short, we anthropomorphize, right? We make short work of the other mind's question and just say, their minds are like ours, only maybe not as smart. Um, anthropomorphisms might be benign, some people think, but I, I suggest that they're not, um, and I have two reasons why I say that they're not. First, because they sometimes have incredible consequences when we assume that animals are operating with the same kind of understanding as we have. Um, for instance, we often assume that animals, and dogs in particular, understand right and wrong. In much of Europe, from the latter Middle Ages to even up to the 18th century, anthropomorphisms to animals in this kind of context had this extraordinary effect, which was that animals were tried and punished often by death, in a court of law for all manner of infractions and trespasses um, against humans and humans' property, from, from thievery to felonious intent and often um, murder. So in this case, for instance, this is a 14th, this is E.P. Evans's interesting work, scholarship, um, 14th century um, sow who is being tried for pushing over and killing a boy, is at that time pigs were running around in the street and often they'd knock into children and they would sometimes hit their heads and die, and often they would be given their own counsel and, the, and the, their, their case would be heard before a judge and precedent would be cited, and then usually they would be found guilty. And then they'd be executed in a public display, dressed in human clothing, um, with an executioner who has a special pair of gloves for the occasion. So this is one extreme result of what happens when we assume that they have a kind of understanding equivalent to ours. And you could say that we are beyond that way of thinking about animals, but a um, hundred years ago, Topsy the elephant, some of you might know the story of Topsy, who was electrocuted publicly for, as this says, murdering some of his abusive trainers. Um, and one could even say that now, when a dog is done something aggressive or is deemed an aggressor or potential aggressor, we don't even bother with a trial and we simply execute them without the even fairness of a trial. That's one possible extreme of anthropomorphisms. In more contemporary times, they make us do things like this. I'm not going to make the case that dressing your dog as a McDonald's Happy Meal is in itself um, a fundamental infraction, but I do think that, assuming that dogs are going to like the same kind of celebrations that we do, sh reveals maybe a little bit of the um, uh, emptiness of our consideration. So, with this in mind, one arm of my research has been taking some of the anthropomorphisms that are commonly made and examining them, looking at the things we say about dogs and the attributions we make about dogs, and seeing if they hold up. Um, and I got very interested at some point in attributions of emotions to dogs. I just grabbed these images off Flickr because they're tagged as sad dog. We assume that we can read dogs' emotions well, and it's not just a reading of their face, but it's an assumption that we're knowing something about their mental state. Um, is, are these dogs sad, or are they um, resting their heads on the ground? These are proud dogs. 
I feel like it's very compelling to make this kind of attribution to the dog. In fact, it's hard to turn off the attribution. Um, it's a natural instinct we have, but could one say, alternately, that that dog is not necessarily experiencing pride, but just holding their head up high because they have a really big stick? Happy dogs, for instance, um, or do the edges of their mouth incline up when they open their mouth somewhat? So I figure I got very interested in this, these kind of attributions, and I thought, well, we could, in fact, test these. Do these hold up? Can, do we have any evidence of this kind of, um, these kind of experiences? Because Morris et al. did a study which showed, for instance, that most dog owners attribute not just primary emotions, which I think everyone would give to um, other mammals, but secondary emotions, which are considered a little more complicated and maybe involve a little more metacognition in some cases. And I, got, I um, did some tests of the latter two attributions of guilt. Three quarters of owners believe that their dogs can feel guilt, and 81% think their dogs can feel jealousy. So my question is, is that so? We start with guilt. <laughs> right, when I was beginning this research, this fascinating case came up, which prompted some of my methods. Um, in England, at some point, uh, there was a dog named Barney, a Doberman, who was perhaps unwisely put in charge overnight of an invaluable teddy bear collection. <laughs> this is the scene they found in the morning. Heads pulled off, arms, legs here and there. It was a total carnage. There was stuffing, fluff, and bear bits everywhere the report said, including Ma uh, Mabel, uh, Elvis's prized teddy bear, was uh, disemboweled. Um, and in fact, a lot of the reports were that this dog, Barney, felt guilty for what he had done and perhaps should not be punished. Darwin, in fact, felt that there was no doubt that a dog should fe can feel shame. And so my methodology was essentially to say, well, what is it behaviorally that makes you feel that the dog is feeling guilty? And is guilt what prompts that behavior? In this case, Barney's looking away, potentially, is averted gaze one component of it. So we did a little experiment. It was a very simple experiment, which had a two-by-two -two design and involved dogs and owners interacting together. We went to owners' homes, and we had them work with their dog. We told them to give their dog a treat and just put it up about a yard away from their dog, but tell the dog not to eat it. And then the owners leave the room, and then one of two things happens. <laughs> the dog is obedient, refrains from eating the treat, or the dog is disobedient and eats the treat. We call the owners back into the room, and if the dog has been obedient, we've asked them to ahead of time, greet their dog happily like they would on just returning to the room. Um, but if the dog's been disobedient, we ask them to scold the dog in their usual way. And this was never very severe. They would just say, no, Finnegan, you know, what have you done? Um, and we videotaped the entire affair. So there were four conditions, essentially. Often, the appropriate thing happened. The dog was obedient and was greeted, or the dog was disobedient and was scolded, but... It's a psychology experiment. Sometimes we misled the owners. The dog was disobedient, had eaten the treat, but we said, oh, your dog didn't eat it. He was good. And so the owner would come in and greet the dog. And sometimes the dog was obedient, had, eat, had not eaten the treat, but we said um, that they had. So the dog was scolded when the owner returned to the room. We videotaped the dog during this, and we were interested in how much of a guilty look the dog was expressing in all of these conditions. So we uh, compiled ideas of what counted as the guilty look from a couple of sources. Darwin, other scientists, as well as owner's report on what it was behaviorally that made them feel like their dog was experiencing guilt. So that included averting gaze, like we saw with Barney, rolling over to show their belly, putting their paw up, dropping their tail in a low wag, retreating, you know, getting out of there, ears down, head down, and licking, air licking. Rolling over, looked something like this, ears down, it's a little hard to see, but he looks naturally guilty, and averting gaze. 
Um, my lab manager, Julie Heck, did a little recreation of the critical scene here so you can get a sense of what it looks like. Leave it, up, leave it, leave it, leave it, leave it. Come back in, she ate it. What did you do? What did you do? <laughs> Poor Gidget. So what we found is that guilt, whether the dog had eaten the treat or not, did not change the rate of the guilty look. They showed the same numbers of these behaviors in both those conditions. Something did change the rate of the guilty look. It was the owner behavior. So when the owners scolded their dogs, that's when they showed the guilty look much more often than when they were greeted on the owner return from the room. And interestingly, they looked the most guilty when they were not actually guilty, but they were punished. The Gidget case that we just saw. Scolding led to the higher rates of the guilty look when they hadn't eaten the treat than when they had. So they looked the most guilty when they were scolded and not when they were guilty. That late makes me think that instead of guilt, some attribution to their mental experience as an explanation for that behavior, we instead have to have another explanation for it. And in my case, I think the explanation is that the look is a kind of appeasement behavior designed to avoid punishment. In fact, it is a very cute look and often does, um, for whatever reason, compel the owner to punish them less severely than if they hadn't put on the look. This is not a look that dogs do naturally, they learn it over interaction with their owners. In fact, I know a humane society that after learning about this research, started teaching the dogs in, that they wanted to have adopted, they taught them the guilty look um, and sent them home and the owners thought, wow, my dog really is responsive to me and only later did they disabuse the owners that they had taught that look. But essentially, we are all teaching that look in our interaction with our dogs. They get reinforced for giving it to us. Note that I'm not saying that dogs don't feel guilt. I'm saying the behavior that we think of as showing as evidence for guilt is actually not necessarily. So the second thing I looked at was that attribution of jealousy. And here it was a little stickier. Again, I wanted to look at the, what the behavior was that owners thought um, proved to them that the dog was feeling jealous. And in most cases, it was that the dog believed that a situation was unfair. In other words, they had treats, they were giving to another dog, they, had, they were paying attention to another dog, and the, their dog comes in, tries to nose in there, and get some of that attention, get some of that, those treats. And they, say, they describe that as jealousy. And so, in my sense, in my mind, and also in some human studies, that notion is predicated on them having a sense of the fairness or, in fact, the unfairness of a situation. So that's where I looked next. Do they have a sense of fairness? In a lot of literature, this is called a test of inequity aversion. Are, are animals averse to a situation which is unequal to them, where it's not equal to them and another animal? Humans sh are, show inequity aversion, if we're over-rewarded for doing a task, um, we tend to change our story about our performance, maybe to explain why we're over-rewarded. If we're under-rewarded for doing a task, not paid as much as somebody else, then people do things to moderate their work effort, work less hard to make it match as much as they're paid. So we created an unequal situation, and we wanted to see if dogs were averse to that. So in this case, we had a social situation. Dogs, subjects, and a control dog were approaching two trainers in turn, um, and the trainers were really only asking them to do a simple task, sitting, when they asked them. So they would start with their owners, their control is um, the black dog here, and our subject is white, and they'd approach each of these trainers, and the trainers would ask them to sit. The fair trainer would reward them both, with one tiny cube of hot dog. And the unfair trainer, well, there were two types of unfair trainers, but there was one who gave the control dog more, so there you might be able to see that there are three bits of hot dog on the plate for the control dog and only one for the subject. Um, and there's another kind of unfair trainer who gives the control dog nothing 
at all, but still gives one hot dog to the subject. And then we let the subject choose which of these trainers, after they've been acclimated to what they deliver, they would like to approach. So in this, our first setup was fair against unfair. So this is, this are, these are plates representing the number of treats that each of the trainers give to our subject and control dog. The fair gives the same. The unfair under-rewards the control dog, right? Gives less to the control dog. And we want to say, well, who does our subject want to approach? They choose randomly between these two trainers. And it's not that surprising in some level. Right? They're given the same amount, and they don't seem to be so worried that the other dog is getting nothing, right? No dog ever complains when getting his dinner. Have you fed the cat? Have you fed the cat yet? They are just concerned with what's in front of them. Then we had this other comparison, which was fair versus the trainer who was unfair to them who over-rewarded the other dog. So every time they approached this unfair trainer, she gave three times as much to the other dog as to them. That seems unfair. They highly preferred to approach the over-rewarding trainer, the unfair trainer, the one who had treated them unfairly, never given them as much as they gave to the other dog, rather than approach the fair trainer. They preferred to associate with a trainer who treated them unfairly, but I wondered, what other feature does that trainer have that the dogs might be sensitive to, rather than their intrinsic unfairness? They do have more food. <laughs> I think that, in this case, it's less a concern with the fairness of the situation to themselves or to others than a concern with the resources available here. Who has all the goods? What looks like jealous behavior might be better described as a sensitivity to and attention to resources. Um, and I think it's fair to say that they're eternal optimists. They keep approaching a trainer who has not given them food simply because that trainer has more resources. So in this way, I've started to test some of the attributions that we make to dogs and it looks like even with a little bit of probing, some of them aren't going to bear out. In some cases, we're giving them experiences, we're thinking that they have emotional experiences, in some cases, cognitive experiences, um, which their behavior belies. So what other approach can we take? Um, since anthropomorphisms don't bear scrutiny, my interest is in describing the dog's mind by considering their sensory and cognitive capacities from their point of view, what's called the Umwelt of the dog. And this is not my word, but this is a word coined by a German biologist um, at the turn of the 20th century named Jakob van, van Oskel. Umwelt really means, I now know, just um, world, universe or environment. Um, but he really used it to mean the world of an animal or even of an individual, the bubble that we all carry around with us that specially describes the things that we're sensitive to seeing. So it's our, our sensory capacity, what it was, what's our equipment that allows us to have the experiences we do, and also our history, our developmental history. What are we prone to notice based on what we've noticed in the past? Um, and also cognitive capacity. And starting with an Umweltian view of an animal, you might get a better sense of what it is like to be that animal. So for instance, he drew this picture of what I have to assume is what a 19th century sitting room in Germany maybe looked like, because this was his image. And he thought, well, this is a pretty straightforward image of what we all see, and that we tend to imagine that any animal entering that room would also see. But then he redrew it from a fly's umwelt, where a fly might be only interested in not the, uh, the fact of tables, but the scent or odor or warmth coming off of the food on the table, or the warmth radiating from the light. And the rest of the room is not invisible. It doesn't disappear exactly. They have the sensory capacities to notice it, but they don't have a, um, a, a functional tone for them. They can't act on it. And so they kind of don't exist, and in that way, the room is redrawn from the perspective of the animal. And so, 
he also imagined the dog's umwelt at some level, and with some emendations, it has to do with what's their visual capacity. They're a little bit nearsighted, so they might not be seeing the things at the top of the room or far away, but also what are the things that are relevant to them? For him, it was things that have a sitting tone, places you might sit, um, and where food has been or it has been dropped, or where people might have been and left their mark. Um, an odor rising along the side of a furniture on the wall. That's the thing that defines the dog's umwelt, and we should try to redraw our understanding of what the dog's experience is with that umwelt in mind. So for dogs, we only have to look at their natural behavior to get, start to get an uh, idea of how to answer what it might be like to look at a dog, uh, to be a dog, and their natural behavior involves a lot of this. Right? Olfaction, sticking their nose in things, in the breeze, in your pocket, in your pant leg, in each other's rumps, because their world is olfactory. Now, I get my title from, uh, as a kind of allusion to Thomas Nagel, the philosopher's early paper, What Is It Like to Be a Bat? Um, where he, after uh, Don Griffin at Rockefeller and his colleagues had determined that bats echolocate to navigate uh, through a room and to, in fact, create a map of the room of sound, something that was mind-boggling to people. Nagel thought, well, what is it like to be an animal like that? Since we don't echolocate, can we ever really know? And his answer was, no, um, we can't know. He doesn't think so. But I defy Nagel. I think that we can. I think that we can start to make an imaginative leap into what it might be like to be a bat or a dog by taking some measure of their sensory apparatus. What does it mean to be an animal who is rooted by olfaction, for instance? Um, get a sense of their cognitive capacities and then redraw the picture from that point of view. So, first, the thing we need to do is to explore their ability a little bit to. Uh, um, their olfactory ability to impress upon us the kind of parameters of smelling, because we are not smelling creatures. Although we all have a nose, um, we really underutilize it, um, and it is in some ways markedly inferior. So just a brief aside to talk about, for instance, their equipment. We've all known that dogs are good smellers, right? We all see working dogs. We know they can smell well, but until recently, we didn't know just how good they are at being smellers. And we still don't even know exactly what it is that makes them so good, but it's probably some combination of these things. For instance, they have many, many more olfactory receptor cells, which are there to snag odor molecules out of the air. So, as a comparison, we have about 5 million olfactory receptor cells. That's actually a good amount. The olfactory epithelium, which holds the receptor cells, is not in the snout, our snout, as it were, but it's under the bridge of the nose, between the eyes. It's a little postage stamp-sized tissue. It has about 5 million cells. That's pretty good. But dogs have hundreds of millions more. So they have not only many more cells to receive information, but many more types of receptors which can receive information. Receptors as the three color receptors we have in our eyes allow us to perceive a Kodachrome universe. With just one of those, our um, visual universe would be diminished. They also have what I kind of like to call a two-nose system. There's the first nose, with which you're um, probably familiar, and although it looks ordinary, it's not ordinary. I mean, their nose is, for instance, moist for a reason, which I'll get into for a second, and their nostrils have, are surrounded by all sorts of musculature that allows the nostrils to act independently. So by getting a different um, odor picture from each nostril, they can have a uh, stereo olfaction, a stereo way of smelling the world. Um, there's also fascinating research that shows that they use their nostrils differentially when smelling new sources. So they start, if you're ever close enough to a dog smelling you to examine, notice that they might start smelling you with their right nostril first. And then if you're um, friendly or familiar, then they start using their left nostril. But if you're, for instance, a veterinarian, um, with, who's been sweating a lot, that's the substance that the researchers used, something that was potentially aversive to a dog, then they stay sniffing with their right nostril. So they're using their nostrils in an important way. That's the first nose. 
But they have another nose, too, that a lot of other non-human animals have. It's called a vomeronasal organ, and it's these fluid-filled sacs that's beneath the nasal septum that divides the nose and above the roof of the mouth. And it's able to detect low molecular weight uh, water-soluble molecules, ones that are non-volatile, not the things that are flying in the air that we can smell, but ones that have to be absorbed in order to be detected. Um, things like pheromones. They might have heard about pheromones. There's a lot of research that shows that hormones like pheromones, which are used to give information, for instance, about sexual status of other members of the species, are detectable by the vomeronasal organ. You have to have a moist nose for that to act as a conveyance of some of the information to the vomeronasal organ. The snout of their nose is not trivial either. So they actually, if you look at a cross-section of their nose, these turbinate bones, as they call it, as they're called, are throughout. It almost looks like a slice of brain. Um, and this allows air that's being sniffed in to go down an elaborate roller coaster ride where it's humidified, it's warmed, um, it's filtered for any particle, stray particles. Um, and in fact, some of the uh, turbinates are lined with epithelial tissue. So the dog can start taking apart the odor, sort of spectrographically, before it even reaches the main epithelium tissue. By contrast, our um, turbinate bones look like that. We have three. So our noses are kind of blunt instruments, kitty rides compared to the uh, roller coaster that is the dog's nose. They also have two different dedicated routes for sniffing. So you know very well that if you want to get a smell out of your nose, you have to do one thing, you exhale it, right? Because the air that comes in has one route, it will hit your epithelial tissue or not, and if you want it to come out, you exhale through your nose. But dogs are seeing the world through their nose, so they don't want to exhale it out, like closing your eyes between seeing vistas. So instead, they have a dedicated route, one red route that goes where airflow goes right just to the uh, olfactory epithelial tissue to be smelled, and another that goes to the lungs for regular respiration. Dogs sniff better than we do, too. Before I started this research, I didn't know that you could be a better or worse sniffer, but you can, and we're worse um, in a couple of ways. One is that we sniff pretty slowly, kind of laconically. If you take a sniff now, will, 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 will you sniff, please? We do that in about one and a half seconds. Dogs are typically taking about five to seven sniffs a second. That just allows for a lot more odor pictures of the world. Um, and again, we go in and out the same nostril. That seems like a natural way to sniff. But researchers who have studied the airflow, um, the fluid dynamics of the air around the dog's nose, have discovered that expired air, exhaled air, is sent out not through the main part of the nostrils, but through the side slits at the side of their nose. And what this does is allow for simultaneous sniffing and expiring, a kind of circular breathing. Not only that, but that expired air, if you notice a dog's nose near a surface, will send up what they call a turbulent canine nostril air jet, like a puff of air that actually will hurry more odor molecules into the nose of the dog. So that all describes the commitment of the sensory equipment to smelling. And then what does it allow them to do? Well, for instance, a tracking dog. If we look at tracking dog's performance, they're asked to follow the odor of someone who has departed some time prior with the evidence, with solely evidence um, of olfactory nature. If we were asked to tell where this person went, we could. There's visual, sufficient visual evidence. But what if that visual evidence is compromised because the waves come and wash over it? Well, the tracking dog can still tell which way that person has gone. And that's because the tracking dog is able to distinguish the concentration of odor, the person's odor, left in their footstep, as we all leave odor in our footsteps, pushed through our shoe from our foot, between the first, first and fifth footstep. The odor concentration is sufficiently different for the tracking dog to tell. That's about two seconds worth. 
And then that's the way the dog determines directionality. I think that if we look at this experientially, what is it like to be a dog who is sensitive to minute differences in concentration of odor, that it actually is going to recreate not only a picture of um, where people have been, but actually recreates an understanding of time itself. For in some ways, if you look at the weaker older odors, they are the older odors. And the stronger odors are the newer odors. So as you leave the house, you and your dog, the dog is smelling the past, what has happened outside, underfoot, on odors on the ground. Or a breeze that comes around the corner might bring information about someone who you do not see yet, who has not arrived, because their odor is sent on the, on the wind to the waiting dog's nostril. So the moment of now for dog is kind of rubber banded to include a little bit of the past and a little bit of the future in it. So this has very much changed the way I have looked at dogs experimentally. I realize not only we have to control for odors in the room because that's a salient component of what dogs are experiencing in the lab, but also we might start looking at some of these cognitive studies and ask them in an olfactory way. And so I'll tell you briefly about my most recent experiment um, in that regard. There is the question in comparative psychology of self-recognition, of this component of the dog's mind or any other animal's mind. Do, does the animal know that it is themselves in a mirror? Or, in fact, do they have a sense of self at all? Do they recognize that they are a self different from other selves? Um, as we look in the mirror and see ourselves and maybe notice a hair that is out of place and work to correct that, you know, would they? This question was asked many years ago by a primatologist named Gordon Gallup as he um, was shaving in the mirror, as I understand it, and he wondered if his chimpanzees would in fact recognize themselves looked in, in, look, if they saw themselves in the mirror as well. And so what did he do? He put a mirror in the enclosures of the chimpanzees. What did they do? Well, first they attacked the mirror because there's another chimpanzee who suddenly entered their enclosure, and, and furthermore, it's one who's attacking them. But they very quickly learned that it was not another ape, um, and they started to use the mirrors in this kind of way to examine themselves, to look at parts of themselves they never saw before. Their rump, you know, inside their mouth, to make faces at this mirror and see themselves making faces back. But he was interested in that, very much so, but thought it doesn't actually show evidence that they're seeing that as themselves. It shows evidence that they've learned to use the mirror as a thing, that, a manipulandum, that they can make do things, make show certain types of pictures. So he designed what's called the mirror self-recognition test, um, where he surreptitiously marked his chimpanzees on the forehead with an odorless red dye. And the next time they saw themselves in the mirror, he looked at them. What did they do? And what the chimpanzees did was they put up their front hands and touched the mark, just as we would do. They passed this mirror self-recognition test. So since that time, this test has been uh, revised and tried with a lot of other species, including dolphins who have been marked along their body and show unusual movements since they don't have hands which with, they can touch the marks in front of the mirror to ostensibly examine it. One elephant named Happy has passed this test. Uh, European magpies have passed the test. I just saw uh, a report coming up here that um, in addition to pigeons and other animals who've been trained to pass the test, there was a study with rhesus macaques who fail the test, typically training them to pass the test. Um, what about dogs? Do they pass the test? No, they do not. They don't seem to care about their image in the mirror. <laughs> Maybe not that surprising in some ways, right? Your dog doesn't seem concerned with their own appearance. They're not grooming animals. There are a lot of good explanations for why they might not be concerned. They certainly can visually appreciate the mirror. They can use the mirror to get information. So in some ways, they understand the mirror, or they can interpret the stimulus. 
um, but they're not passing the test. I think the punchline is this. What about if the mirror smelled? What if the mirror smelled of them? If the image they saw in the mirror were more suited to their Umwelt, they're not visual creatures. They're not concerned with the mark on their paw, except insofar as it might taste good. Um, let's look at their natural behavior. Because of this, they do that. They're investigating odors all the time. Now, they're usually odors of other dogs, but these are odors that have elements that would be indic indicative of who the dogs are, sort of signature mixes, which are smellable and detectable by the vomeronasal organ. So, prompted by this, I set out to design, essentially, um, an olfactory mirror to see if dogs use smell to recognize themselves as they do to recognize others. So I'm happy to say I don't have an actual mirror that smells, that will <laughs> reflect your smell, because that might be horrifying. But instead, what we did is we used the same medium that dogs use to communicate information about themselves to others, which is their urine. We asked owners to collect a small amount of their dog's urine, and then we presented it to them in a novel context, in a canister, as well as presenting to them um, a little bit of the urine of an unknown dog, and as well as presenting something analogous to, not a perfect analogy, um, to be fair, to their image marked. So the, um, their own urine, but marked with another odorous substance. Um, an experimenter would draw their attention to the canisters, and then they were allowed to examine them ad lib, and we were basically testing investigation time. How long did they spend sniffing? Um, so I thought I'd, I'd, this isn't in, it also not answering what it's like to be a dog, but it's sort of what is it like to be a dog researcher. Um, this is, I have a little bit of a cut of uh, some of our subjects participating, so you can see what it's like. Very exhaustive search. There's always an outlier. This is our outlier. In fact, I sped up the tape a little bit, so because <laughs> she spent so long on it. <laughs> and that is why. So again, we were looking at how long do they sniff the pee? Sorry, let me move to the next slide. And we did a couple of different comparisons. First, we did that comparison of their own odor and the odor of another dog. And what we found is that they spend significantly longer sniffing the odor of the other dog. That's nice because it's evidence that we, that we brought into the lab the behavior that we see in the world, that they're going to spend more time sniffing others' markings and not as much time, if any, going back and checking their own. And then we compared how they how long they spent investigating themselves and themselves marked. And again, they spent more time investigating the odor of themselves when it was marked. We also compared that to a control where it was just the marked smell to make sure that it wasn't just a fascinating smell for them. And they don't spend any longer, in fact slightly less, investigating the smell by itself than their own urine marked with that smell. So what I want to say based on this is that although the mirror self-recognition test is not a perfect test, 
This is not a perfect analog of it, but at some level, when we start to consider the dog from an olfactory point of view, we can see that we might be able to get evidence that they're recognizing their own odor as something like themselves, that kind of entry to the elusive sense of self, which is so hard to experimentally investigate with nonverbal others. Okay, that's all I have for you. I think the aim of scientific in inquiry into others' minds should take that Umweltian perspective. And so what is it like to be the animal? It seems to me you have to start with that animal's sensory and cognitive equipment, uh, ask, and that's your way of asking them, and they will answer. Thank you very much. And I am happy to take questions, of which I know there are more than zero. Yes, right in the middle. Hang on, hang on. Yes, great. Thanks. Um, yeah, so you mentioned way at the beginning of the lecture that dogs make the perfect subject. So why, why would you say that that's the case? Well, in my case, when I was interested in investigating mind, um, the very first study that I did was about play, because I was interested in this theoretical notion, theory of mind, which, as humans, we all develop, most normally developing people develop, which is ability to think about oneself and others, um, and know that others' minds are different from one's own. And one of the contexts in which we might learn some of this is in play. Um, and uh, I was casting about as a graduate student for a species to study which played, because I wanted to look at a natural behavior to see a natural context in which this metacognitive ability might emerge. Um, and I looked at a lot of primates who play, but certainly more often when they're juveniles and less often when they're adults, and also can disappear from view and play out of view of you. And meanwhile, I, was, I had a dog and I was taking her three times a day to the park, and it took me about six months, because I was an obtuse graduate student, to realize like, I had a subject here who was playing all the time, engaged in social play, and that's when I started taping dogs. So for some things, I think they're ubiquity, and um, they're, so for instance, you know, to get dogs to come into the dog lab, um, it's not difficult. We don't have to go find the dogs. Owners bring their dogs. They come with them and happily bring the dogs, which is fantastic. So in some ways, they're a great subject for the beginnings of, experiment, of observation or experimental inquiry into mind. They're not the easiest one, and they certainly weren't looked at for a long time, I think partly because they are domesticated. Um, and people were less interested in domesticated animals, and some, and some may still be, that in some way they're adulterated, that they're not really true minds. You know? But it seems to me they are an even more interesting case if we're interested in extrapolating from human cognition and to talk about non-humans, because they are the, the result of selective breeding by this mind, by the human mind. So they bear to, you know, the results of natural selection and of artificial selection, and that's fascinating. Um, okay, so I, my question is about sort of the guilt uh, sure. question. Um, I guess, uh, you know, I, I normally associate guilt with doing something wrong. Um, and in this case, it was just uh, either eating or not eating mm -hmm. a, a treat. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, and I sort of think of guilt as arising from kind of sympathy or the ability to empathize and think I don't, I wouldn't want that to happen to me or something, right? Uh, hmm. um, in, in other words, like, have you thought of maybe following that up with like a, a, some... A more serious infraction. Right, exactly. Right. No, I haven't, although that's an interesting idea. But the, exactly the way you phrase what guilt involves makes it seem to me a much less likelier emotion that we could attribute to dogs, right? That a lot of... It, not only is our guilt often not behaviorally obvious to begin with, but in other words, you just feel internally the guilt. But what exactly prompts it, and, and it's, it has to do with uh, our enculturation as humans. You know, we learn how to be guilty, um, and it seems less likely that that would be something that, that uh, canids would experience. But 
I think that would be really fascinating to see. I don't know what greater infraction dogs in a general purpose way do. I mean, eating, there are lot, I guess there are actually, I can think of lots of misbehavior. <laughs> there are lots of complaints based on, you know, dog misbehavior that maybe we could try to recreate. Um, but surprisingly, in this case, dogs still had a reaction. I think that's also the kind of takeaway. They had differential reaction in different, in different settings. Um, and so they were noticing differences in those settings. Uh, it's just that the difference they noted was not the one that we think they should notice. Yeah. So in, emo in emotional psychology and emotional psychology, yes. uh, they, there's like this divide between like basal emotions, like fear and happiness, versus mm -hmm. the more socially tinged emotions that we label guilt, shame. Yes. And I'm wondering, have you, I know you looked at guilt and jealousy because of your survey and like seeing that the owners like said, oh, I'm sure I can like see yeah. this, but has your lab also investigated like the more basal emotions? Primary because, emotions, Because right. they don't require necessarily no. the owner. And I think that we haven't, but I think neurologically most people would assent that um, non-human mammals experience basic emotions, right? That there's nothing sufficiently different in their neural setup that we, and, and certainly behavior that correlates with it, um, uh, approaching things which give them pleasure repeatedly and avoiding things you know, which make them sad or upset or however you want to describe, uh, distancing, the emotion that might correlate to a distancing um, behavior. So I feel like that's pretty much agreed, not entirely, but pretty much agreed upon. And it's these secondary emotions, more complicated emotions that are still up for grabs. Yes. Um, when you have uh, two dogs together yeah. and you pet one of them exclusively, the other dog often gets agitated. Yes. Is that a form of jealousy? That's, thank you for your choice of words there, yes. Um, well, that's exactly the experience that leads people, um, at least in our survey, to attribute jealousy to their dogs. Exactly that. You're giving attention to one dog or you're doling out treats or resources to one dog, and the other dog gets agitated, tries to move between you and the other dog, whines, barks, otherwise tries to do attention-getting behaviors, right? So that's what is being described as jealousy. And in my experiment, what I, what I felt like is for that to be jealousy in the way that we think of jealousy, which is, I think, the important thing to start with here. I mean, we're trying to decide about dogs. Do they have experiences, mental experiences, which match our own in these ways? The way we think about jealousy, it has to do with, it's predicated on some understanding of fairness of, and, the, and the ultimate unfairness of that situation where you're giving all the attention to one dog. So if they're not actually so concerned about fairness, at least not in the way that we seem to be, or not perceiving it as the most salient attribute of what's happening, then I think one can question whether jealousy is the best explanation for their behavior. Yes, way in the back. Oh, sorry, upstairs, upstairs. Sorry, and then I'll go down. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. No, I mean, I know researchers who do the training of diabetic alert dogs and as well as are trying to train cancer detection dogs and there are hypoglycemia um, and di um, alert dogs and even some seizure detection dogs. I haven't been involved in their training. What's, it's wonderful and it, fascinating training. It is olfactory training, you know. I mean, basically, they're trained on um, the odor of blood sugar, um, which is a, another way that I think that trying to get in the mind... Uh, the mind of the dog, the umwelt of the dog, is a little bit mind-boggling because we don't think typically of blood sugar levels having a certain odor. But it is discriminable by dogs and they're highly reliable at doing it. And I'd say it's a fantastic that you're gonna have such a dog. And I think the only thing is if you're healthy, then the dog gets no um, reward for finding out <laughs> that your <laughs> blood sugar is off the charts. So you have to, you know, occasionally t test them with the stimulus that, um, that, that you can reward them for. 
Well, that's fascinating, right, but they're going to have a relationship with you, and you're going to be the one who's, who they're uh, kind of entrained on and attentive to. But, right, as with all working dogs, do they not notice the sensory environment that they're in? No, they almost certainly do, but when they're working and they form a very strong delineation between working time and non-working time, they're really focused on their work exclusively, and you, and you will be your dog's work. Yeah, so right there. To what audience? You know, I mean, anyone who's interested in dogs, actually, I feel like most dog owners are naturally curious. Not only do we come with a vocabulary immediately that we want to put on the dogs, but we want to have the answers to the questions about who the dogs are. We want to be able to s state what their personality is like, you know, whether they're clever or not how they would perform in certain settings. We want to be able to predict their behavior. So dog owners are um, a very receptive audience. And as, you know, as a dog, for someone who lives with dogs myself, I know that it, it, my research reflects back on how I interact with them. In the academic world, it's slightly different. I, it is. Um, but partly because, well, Laurie has established an amazing lab here. If you haven't visited it with your dog, you should. Um, and, but this is very recent work, and, as I, and there was, when I was a graduate student, just anecdotally, and I wanted to study dogs, I had to argue for it, um, and I, uh, a lot of people were definitely not convinced that I should be able to do a dissertation or defend or pass a defense based on doing dog research, um, because, um, just because of historically how we've considered dogs, not Certainly, behaviorally, there's been a lot of research looking at dogs from, for the last 150 years, maybe, 130 years at least, but, but not cognitively, not with making attributions to their minds. So it's a slightly different crowd um, and a slightly different reception. But it's, that's somewhat changing when we show novel methods for investigating cognition that can come up uh, in comparative psychological world, just as we've done with non-human primates and ungulates, and now farm animals as well, right? I think they're kind of benefiting from an interest in, in the, do the domesticated animals' cognition. Now there's a lot of farm domesticated animal cognition work coming out too, which is amazing. Uh, we have one right here, which is easy for me, so. Okay, good. I was um, impressed by your overview of the depiction of dogs in artwork. <clears throat> So I want to ask you a very non-scientific question. Mm. I'm interested in your view of whether you think dogs, as depicted in cartoons like Tom and Jerry, are hopelessly anthropomorphized. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh. And another thing that came into my mind when you showed the dog trashing the place was the the silly movie with Owen Wilson and Jennifer Aniston. I think it was called Marley and Me. Mm. I want, I'm right, just interested right, right. In the, your, bad, the bad dog, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm just interested in your, your view yeah. of that. That's yeah, well, as a matter of fact, thanks for your question, that most depiction of dogs uh, in movies, um, in cartoons, certainly, is, is highly anthropomorphic. In fact, animators, not just dogs, dogs are not the only ones subject to this, but animators, you know, it intentionally anthropomorphize their subjects. And, it, and as somebody with a young child, I now am reminded that when you look at mat uh, reading material for young children, it's almost exclusively animals talking to each other who we talk to, talk to about that person is saying that, and they're having exactly the sentiments that we're having, but they're all animals. <laughs> they don't have animal character characteristics particularly. And so I think, yeah, that's riding off of the fact that it is a, we have a natural tendency to anthropomorphize. It didn't come up with domestication that we started anthropomorphizing. It's, in fact, we've been, people have been scolding us for anthropomorphizing for thousands of years because initially the anthropomorphisms were um, uh, of the gods, right? That gods might be in mortal form, and that was censored. Um, but then to predict weather, you know, we say that a wind is angry. Um, at us, uh, inanimate objects to kind of understand the behavior, the movement of the seas. We've attributed human characteristics to those. So we've been doing it forever. I think it's quite a natural tendency and cartoons take advantage of that fully, yeah. 
Yes, right there. It's always said that some breeds of dogs are more intelligent than others. They learn yes. faster or they can understand more complex, co cognitively complex situations. So w I wondered how many of your interesting <coughs> observations are generalizable across breeds? And if you pick right. particular breeds as your subject. Right. Well, I, I haven't. And in fact, because there is a lot of groundwork that could be done in, in dog cognition before we start narrowing in on interesting questions like that, a lot of the work that's been done out there has been of just any breed, right? The idea is to make some statement about dogs, per se, not about golden retrievers, exactly. Um, but there's a little bit of work in that direction. But to your point, to your, to your pr premise of the question too, I very much um, question talking about different dogs as having different intelligence, or at least a ranking of intelligence from the smartest to the least smart, right? I mean, it's certainly the case that there are some dogs, like, say, Border Collies, who might perform high on these intelligence scales, who are extremely proficient at their jobs, right, of herding. But they're horrible at doing other things, like being a calm dog who sits and waits for you all day by themselves at home, doing nothing. You know, whereas some of the other dogs who are really non-responsive to problem-solving tasks and so forth um, are really good at something else because when they are faced with a problem, they look toward their owner, the tool who can solve the problem for them. Well, that's kind of considered stupid because they don't persist at the problem, but it's actually, in another way, really smart because the owner does open the refrigerator. We solve that problem for them every day, you know? And so, what counts as smart? And if you said what counts as smart in the uh, living among humans, I would say it's some of the dogs who are sometimes ranked lowest on those intelligence scales, right? Um, but it, it would, nonetheless, it would be fascinating with many of these studies to look at single breeds. And when I did play research, I was fascinated by the fact that, um, as anecdotally reported, lots of same breed dogs seem to play with each other differently than they did with different breeds. So you'd have suddenly a lot of Weimaraners who were great, doing great rough and tumble play with each other. And I, I'm curious, and I've not investigated it yet, but whether there's something about the signals that they're reading from each other that allows them to be um, more rambunctious without any um, repercussions, something like that. So it would be fascinating, yeah. I haven't studied seeing eye dogs, a good population, but then again, you know, they're also committed to their project, and so you're not going to get the kind of natural dog behavior which you'd like to get when you are sampling a dog and trying to generalize therefrom. There was something right up front, yeah. So a few of us here, uh, we go to Southern Connecticut State University, and right now um, we're going. Uh, right now we're taking a few courses on sort of the progression of the sense of the self through history and a human perspective. But um, when you were talking about how they, how dogs, look, they see themselves through their sense of smell, I was going. Um, do you think that dogs um, have the same sense? Like, do they have the same sense of self through their ability to smell? versus through humans' way of seeing themselves visually? Is it them? Uh, good question. Right. I, well, almost certainly I doubt that it's identical, right? Our sense of self is caught up in not just an individual sense, in not just an autobiographical sense of myself through time, but a cultural sense of how we define self in the culture we're in, which is different in non-Western cultures than in Western cultures, for instance. So there's that. That's all in my sense of self. Um, and then there are individual differences. But so to change modality on us, I think, probably does change that. And, and you don't have the same kind of cultural influences in, in populations of dogs of necessity as you do in, in the human population. So that would change as well. I think at base, all I could possibly be talking about by talking about sense of self with both species groups is just thinking about themselves as different from others Right? So distinguishing themselves, not necessarily in a ruminative, thoughtful way, but um, in terms of having a kind of understanding of themselves. Like, I did that in the past, and I'm going to do this, in the, and someone else did or didn't do those things with me. So sort of a distinction of oneself and others in the world. And I think that's maybe the minimal way we could define self. Hmm. 
Yes, there's in the middle and the back. I have you running around, Henry. Sorry. Hi, thanks. If I can speak from a humanities perspective. I was really interested with the opening with the, um, uh, the sort of cultural and historical construction of the idea of a dog in relation to humans. Yeah. And I think what was quite interesting by the medieval sort of mock trials of animals, it comes out of a sort of theological understanding of animals not having a soul. Yes. Um, and, uh, and that's a very interesting, I'm a theologian, so there's a very interesting idea about what happens if a dog comes and eats the consecrated host and runs away from the altar. Yeah. You know, have, have they received the body of Christ or not? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a very sort of tricky <laughs> theological canon law question, which I'm not sure I could answer if anybody asked me. Um, but I'm just wondering whether um, in the move to uh, having animals painted as portrait, portraits of the animals, it comes around at a time when... Um, uh, the idea of humans having a soul has also diminished, and therefore the uh, the dogs, as it were, their, as it were, position in the world can be equal to ours because mm. can, we're, you know, diminished, we're so diminished, and so they're ro in, yeah. in, in, they're enhanced, but we sort of meet part way a but little something bit. Something like that, yeah. Because I think I think that's that. So even though they have the mock trials in the medieval period, because they don't have a soul, then it doesn't really doesn't ultimately really matter. makes no difference whether they commit yeah. a crime or not. But in these sort of in our era it might have more of an uh, import because of our ambiguity about human souls and salvation. That's fascinating. I don't know. I, and I certainly has, I haven't, in, I haven't ever traced the, you know, the trajectory of uh, how we've thought about animal souls over, over time. But I think you're right, certainly culturally today, that our, it, our willingness to attribute having, uh, souls to others, to which is probably not so distant from our willingness to attribute them to especially the animals we keep in our homes. Maybe not. Maybe they are still a pre uh, preserved class, though. So it would be dogs and cats or maybe some other domestic animals. But I wonder if, if you stepped a little bit outside of that to the cat, to the pigs who were routinely tried, if they would be granted the same uh, level. Um, but fascinating. Thanks. Um, right in, way in the back, under the light. Uh, I've been wondering about uh, the power of smell and potentially in training dogs or in yeah. helping dogs. Like thinking about if smell is so powerful to them, like, you know, even in working with word dogs, we're always using food or touch or attention, but should we be thinking about smell in terms of calming dogs or even in right. training dogs or thinking about how to, how to work with dogs? Should we be using smell more as, as humans? Well, it's, it's an interesting question. Yeah, I think that smell might not be intrinsically rewarding. So if you're doing a specific rewarding task, um, the smell itself on its own is probably not rewarding. I mean, I imagine that for smell, if we try to picture what it's like to be a smelling creature, it's just information about, it's just information, just the way that I have a lot of visual information in this room and I'm, I'm not re necessarily rewarded by it. So I don't think it would be a good specific reward. But I think it is important to be conscious of the potential smells in the environment in a training environment, or even in your home environment, right? I mean, given that we all carry a lot of smells with us, even the very clean among us is just a great bubble of smell to the dog. You know, smells that we exude when we're in a training context. Uh, if we're stressed, just as behaviorally, that can go down the leash to the dog. Maybe the smell can also make the dog anxious. So I haven't seen any research looking into that, but I would love to see kind of if there's a contagious emotional reaction, probably smell mediated, that interferes with training. Thanks. So dress for down here. Oh, and then I'm gonna get to the other side of the room, no, which no, I've been neglecting, I'm no. sorry. Um, who was it? Uh, I'm three in. So when I told my wife that I was coming to hear you, uh, she said, are you going to ask her about midnight? And <laughs> the very strange thing she does, and you've almost demanded that I do, so I will. <laughs> um, so Midnight is a 10-year-old black lab who's lived with us for eight months, and I was apparently entirely unaware of uh, what my wife regards as a very strange habit. I wonder if you've encountered it before, but you're showing us the experiment of the dog smelling the pee prompts this. So apparently, uh, unbeknownst to me, Midnight goes out in the world, smells where she herself has peed, and then smells herself. Smell goes and smells her rump or her under yeah, her exactly. belly. Uh -huh. Exactly. Yeah. Compares notes. Huh. 
I haven't ever heard about, that might be a N of one. No, I have <laughs> never heard about that type of behavior. That's, in, that's interesting, right. I can tell my wife she has an exceptional dog. <laughs> thank <laughs> thank very you pleased. very much, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, over on this side. Henry Choice. Thank you. That's very nice of you. Terrific. That's what you think. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, certainly a lot of tenacity. Well, that's not a yes or no question, is it? That's <laughs> certainly a lot of tenacity by y for you, right? It's not trivially easy to get your dog to pee and poo on, on command and location, so huzzah, congratulations to you for doing that. Yes. The dog, if you are reinforcing them correctly, it's easy for them to do that. It's just that it's often we do not have the patience and fortitude to persist with the training such that they will understand what we're asking of them and be able to do it. So good job. Thank you. Yes, behind her. Hi. Hi. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about um, kind of 19th century debates about the arbitrary nature of animal taxonomy. Mm. Um, and so kind of, kind of beyond um, dogs having a sense of individual self, um, do dogs have any sense of like a group of dogs either in relation to um, humans or other animals or like among breeds? Or is that something that we project onto? By a group of dogs, do you mean... What do you mean by a group of dogs? Like that's the, like a, are they? A, a, yeah, like. A, a, those are all dogs? Yeah, kind of like ontological understanding of right. like things that are dogs. Well, there's some science that potentially could uh, address that, which is that dogs are able to recognize um, and discriminate dog from non-dog faces, right? They do, even there's a face of a goat looks very much like a dog. Even seeing a picture, dogs are, if they're trained to, um, push the screen when they see a dog face, they don't push the screen when they see the goat face. So they have a sense of dogness um, in, in much the way that we do at some level. Breeds, I don't know, but there might be an, an reflexive kind of instinctive understanding of um, int intra-breeds, other members of their own breed based on similar body mapping. But that's the hypothesis, I don't know for sure. Good question, thanks. Um, from what I understand, a lot of the discoveries for human psychology and abnormal psychology have kind of come from when things have gone awry and gone wrong. Mm. Um, <laughs> has there been any research into the cognitive abilities of dogs through dogs that have experienced some kind of trauma? Oh, fascinating, right. There's the abnormal cog dog, abnormal dog cognition. Um, right, we, ha I don't, I don't know about that. You know, no, the only dogs that have really come, so most of the studies are, you know, there are naturalistic observations where we go out in the world and study dogs behaving, so those are not exceptional, we're just looking at samples. There are experimental studies which are often comparative psychologically driven, where you ask for people, to, people and their dogs to come in and you give them an experimental test, but there too you're looking for a sample. And there have only been a couple of cases where there's some dog out in the world that kind of draws the cognitive researchers to them, and it's usually for their exceptional behaviors, not for their abnormal behaviors. Um, like, um, I'm thinking of Rico, who was a border collie, who Julianne Kaminsky heard from their owners that this is a border collie who knew 200 words, you know, and she went and sort of investigated that one dog, and there have been some others. But I haven't heard of the kind of Instead, we kind of recast those dogs as um, sort of misbehaving dogs, you know, as opposed to dogs who have, like, interestingly different cognition. But now that you ask that, I think we should be looking for them. <laughs> we have one back here. Yeah. Um, 
So in your guilt study, um, you found that, you know, it wasn't necessarily that got, that uh, dogs were feeling guilt per se, but more so uh, um, an aversion to their owner's, you know, behavior and scolding them. Yeah. Um, now, if we apply that to like human uh, behavior and yeah. emotion, how, how much um, can we say that like humans actually experience guilt right. um, or is it more so a aversion or a tactic to minimize, right. um, you know, any potential? Aversive yeah. results, right. Yeah, exactly. yeah, it's a great question. I think a lot of our learning of, of, of how to, of what to label and kind of how to behave in certain circumstances that we then call our secondary emotions or identify as our secondary emotions were probably learned through associative learning. You know, when you do something and you're punished for that, you learn that that was the wrong th something that you shouldn't be doing and then you might start to have anticipatory feelings of guilt that there was something wrong based on that and we learn that through a kind of conditioning, you know, learning like a dog might learn it, right? Now, an emotions researcher would have a lot more to say than of what develops there from, which I don't know if it develops in dogs, right? We have to be agnostic about it. So there, the roots split. But I do think that they have a common, they have a, a common history in the development of the individual. Yeah. Yeah, right next to you. Thanks so much for the great talk. I actually had the same question as the, the last person, but I'm wondering how you're really thinking about the dog-human relationship in your science, and given that that's such a strong component of these dogs' lives. How is that shaping behavior? How are you factoring that in? Uh, it, well, in different studies, differently, right? Um, so at the very base level, when you deal with dogs, you have to, their natural environment is the anthropogenic environment in which we found ourselves. Their natural environment is with humans. There aren't um, domestic dogs who are out there living on their own, outside of human societies, particularly. Um, so you have to kind of imagine that it's this setting in which we should consider them as naturally behaving. That said, owners can really influence the behavior of their dogs. So in any experimental setting, one has to limit, control very much, what the owner can do to potentially cue the dog about how to behave, because the owner going into an experiment has a lot of thoughts about how they should behave, or their dog should behave, kind of as their proxy to, be, to behave well. Um, and so you have to stop, limit their cueing, and that often means um, having the owner present, because having the owner separate is itself a problem, right? The dog will then want to just get to the return to the owner, maybe not want to participate in your task, um, but limiting the number of things they can do in the, in the cues they can give to the dogs. Often we um, ask the owner to do a distractor task, a dis which is just a distraction for the owner. So, for instance, in the olfactory mirror task, where we, the owners started out holding their dogs, and then we, when the experimenter turns her back, they're supposed to release their dogs. Um, but we don't want the owner to have any feeling like, uh, I want to just subtly point that the dog should go one way or another based on their hypothesis of where the dog should go. Um, so we have them instead doing another task. They're responsible for counting the number of times the dog is looking back at them. And at the end, their experience of that event was like five times. My dog looked back at me five times, right? So they, so that's one way that you can kind of block it. Um, in other cases, you're interested in the human dog dynamic per se. You know, that's the thing we study. So one of my other f lines of research, which has to do with play, we looked at human um, dog play. Uh, and there we want the human to be involved and however they want to be involved and playing with the dog and we're coding both human and dog behavior in that case. Thanks. Yeah. There's a mic right behind you. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> um, I understand in, um, in humans that super tasters are more likely to be women. And that what are more likely super to be? Super tasters? Uh-huh, yes. And I wondered if you noted any differences in your research between male and female dogs. Super smellers. In their ability right. to either, in their interest in right. smelling or their ability to scent detect? Well, so we haven't done any studies. It's a great question of... Um, individual variability in smell. So we're, because we're not doing threshold detection tasks, not, my research isn't like how, how little of a substance can they detect. All the substances in the couple of studies I've done where we present them an odorant stimulus, it's detectable. You know, sometimes it's even detectable by us. So it's not a question of being good enough to smell it at all. Um, but 
there still could be really large individual differences between them, you're right, and which we haven't looked at at all, and we haven't looked at a gender difference either, and what we, the well, only thing we do know about is that we had all um, spayed or neutered dogs, so we don't have any um, female dogs who were going th hormonally through something which might change their sense of smell, which is one of the hypothesized reasons for why some women are better smellers, for instance, which women are, are on the whole considered better smellers than men, um, and it's considered related to the hormones. So we haven't looked at it. It's a good question. Uh, we're just starting. We, we feel like we're just getting started on this. I mean, the question mark at the end of my title slide is really a pronounced question mark. We, s we really don't know that much about dog cognition yet. One more question. Okay, one more question. Up to you. Right there. <laughs> Hi, um, so I have a question that's like specific to the um, guilt study. So you found that there's a difference in um, guilty reaction when the dog um, actually did not eat <laughs> versus when they did. And I'm wondering when I think, what's it like to be a dog? Is there some sort of mental representation of right and wrong, even if that's not connected to guilt? As in, I did what I was supposed to do, yeah, I'm being scolded, so there's um, a more of a reaction. So basically, mm -hmm. what do you think are the implications of that difference mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. whether they had or had not eaten right, and still right. received scolding? Yeah, that's a good point. So that's that final observation was that in the case where they were not guilty, but they were scolded, so the most unfair case to them, really. Um, they looked the most guilty. Um, and I think that the implication is that there are internalizing, that there is a right and wrong scenario. Now, what they consider the right or wrong thing is probably not as clear-cut as it is for us. We assign them a task, and there was a clear right and a clear wrong. Um, for the dog, is it like that? Is it so defined? Probably not. But I think that is a little bit um, provocative that there might be s some understanding. And certainly any, any dog who is a well-behaving dog is essentially a dog who has learned the rules for behavior around you, right? And one could say there are right ways to behave in certain contexts. That's what a well-behaved dog or trained dog has done has learned, and that there are wrong ways. And so yes, at some level, right, they might be understanding that right or wrong. Yep. All right, well, please join me in thanking Dr. Horowitz for a wonderful talk. Thank you. And, uh